All right, this is a, an oral history interview with Congressman Jeff Davis of the 4th Congressional District in Kentucky for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress. We are in the Congressman's Washington office. Today is Wednesday, July 8th. Oh, it's uh, September 15th. I'm sorry, September 15th. <laughs> I'm using an old form here, I guess. And I'm historian Brian Williams. Thank you for the correction. Um, <coughs> Congressman, let's start with, uh, would you give me your birth date and place of birth? Uh, it's uh, 26 October 1958. I was born in uh, Montreal, Canada. I was curious about that. Uh, so bring me well, the I know, steps uh, from based on, on what I've been told by uh, and the uh, little contact I've had with my father, he uh, confirmed this. But I was conceived in Western Pennsylvania. My mother was uh, uh, attending school in Canada. Uh, I was briefly married to my dad, who I actually met when I was 25 years old. I was serving the army. I was a couple of years out of West Point at the time, and. Uh, came to the United States, or I guess back into the United States when I was about uh, a year and a half old, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Right. Well, let's go through that history just really briefly. Uh, did you move to Pennsylvania, was it, uh, when you came back from Canada? Uh, yeah, that's where my, uh, my mother's family is from in western Pennsylvania. And I think the thing that's really remarkable for me uh, to sit here, uh, I, the military provided uh, both handholds and turning places for me. Uh, I largely grew up as in a single parent family. Uh, but my mom was uh, married for a time uh, in a very destructive relationship to a, a very violent alcoholic man who uh, uh, basically uh, the first fight that I was in uh, when I was six years old was not on the playground. It was actually stepping between uh, her and uh, him hitting her and going to the floor. And that was kind of an introduction to, uh, as I uh, shared after my mom had passed away, she never liked to talk about that at all. It was, uh, I think, a different time than now with openness. She made me swear to secrecy. And, uh, it was, uh, I didn't know that dysfunction was dysfunctional until I was in my 20s. And I left home, uh, I actually made the determination uh, to go in the Army when I was in eighth grade and got a, a little recruiting brochure with a picture of an Army Ranger on it that I kept next to my bed for the next four years. Uh, joined the Army at 17, two weeks out of high school, uh, and uh, enjoyed the uh, opportunity immensely. It was really took me into a different world uh, on, on a number of counts. One was being part of something bigger than yourself. Literally, for me, the Army became a family. It was the most stability and structure I had ever known. And I think the second thing is I began to learn that, uh, that we never do anything in and of ourselves. It's always a group of people working together towards an end, even what might benefit me individually. Mm -hmm. When you say you were in eighth grade or eight years old? when you Eighth were grade. Eighth grade. Uh, was there anything in particular uh, intrigues you about the military at that point? Or well, I, I look back on it as I hit midlife, and really with my mom's last year of life when she was terminally ill, it allowed me to uh, sift through uh, not only old photos and, and what, I wouldn't call it memorabilia, but things that have memories tied to them as I was uh, going through her things in that last year of life and trying to organize her affairs for her. The, the conclusion that I really came to having to relive a lot of difficult experiences that had largely remained in the background. I've been blessed with a, uh, with a wonderful wife of 26 years, uh, six children, uh, two of whom are professionals now, uh, and the other four are working their way up the ladder. They, I, I think for me, I made the determination to uh, become a ranger, do a lot of the things I did in the Army, not only out of a sense of patriotism and an expectation, frankly, that everybody that I knew was expected to serve the country, uh, but it was also a way to never get hurt again, uh, to be the strongest and the toughest. But a funny transformation uh, happened along the way. I was around these very rugged and tough men who also had a gentle side to them. They represented values of honor uh, and duty, and I saw this repeated over and over in the non-commissioned officers uh, and the officers that I was around. And so uh, when I began to realize there was a different kind of uh, family and life possibilities. I think uh, for me it opened up in a couple of ways. I, I, I joke with my friends, I got two things out of West Point. Uh, I became a Christian. I accepted Jesus Christ in my second year at the academy, which dramatically improved my military performance of all things in terms of self-discipline and focus. And then I met my wife my senior year. Uh, we had a lot of fun in the military. I enjoyed it immensely. And I, I, I would say for me, the, the Army is the ultimate level playing field. And so I felt it, for the first time I was really earning uh, things as opposed to either just getting by in high school or uh, learning how to, uh, let's say, work a system, but understand that every action that we have has consequences. And, and uh, 
seeing people invest in me, which was a new thing, uh, I began emulating that and investing in others. And it's been fascinating now that I'm in my 50s to look back uh, and see the fruit that's come from so many of those relationships as young leaders have developed or the folks who invested in many in our year group are now retired and, and running the Army. I, I think the highlight of this came for me two weeks ago when General Casey invited me to come uh, back, uh, the former Army private and kid from the messed up family a long time ago, and address uh, all of the Army's new general officers uh, in the Strategic Leadership Conference on relationships with Congress and civil military relations. And, and I found a tremendous irony in that uh, uh, as well. But it's a, I think it points again to the great opportunities we have in America. Uh, was your wife military as well? She, she might as well have been. I, no, she's, she was a uh, biologist by training, uh, taught uh, uh, math and science in school, but as many of us who became Army aviators say, our, our spouses were the key to us graduating because they had to learn the emergency procedures and all the aircraft limitations and aerodynamics as well as we did to, uh, to drill us and all those things at night. Where did you meet her then? I actually met her at the military academy. So what was she doing there? Well, it's a... a maybe a little bit different than the way we, uh, the school was structured. We're in, we were in 36 lettered companies at the time with about uh, 120 cadets in each company. And in the 4th Regiment, on the other side of the Corps, I was in Company E1. I uh, uh, was, had an academic sponsor. It was uh, Colonel Barry, who was the head of the law department at the time. He was actually a World War II veteran who was still uh, involved in teaching. And one of my former roommates and I went down for dinner a group of about 14 cadets in H-4 had invited uh, 14 girls up from the College of St. Elizabeth in, uh, uh, near Morristown, New Jersey. And as I was eating my uh, frozen sausage that I had microwaved, uh, quality uh, or quantity equals quality, and I, I think for cadets and young soldiers. And so got the word that uh, my roommate was in the other room all by himself, and I walked in and saw this great paradox of uh, uh, 14 guys had left their 14 uh, ladies who had come up and were watching the Texas-Arkansas game, I walked into the room and sat down on the floor next to the only open space, and uh, there was my future wife. Neither of us knew that we would end up spending our lives together, but uh, literally this, uh, this next month will be 29 years ago that we met, and we've been together in one form or another ever since. It was very exciting. Uh, tell us about your military career prior to West Point. Well, I enlisted in the, in the Army and still had the goal to get into the military academy. I received an appointment to uh, a preparatory school, the United States Military Academy Prep School, that uh, was located at that time at Fort Monmouth. Uh, it had been at Fort Belvoir before that, and I understand now the uh, Department of the Army is looking at moving it up to West Point. But what it did was uh, two things. It, it gave me a, uh, uh, a year to mature, but most importantly to develop the academic skills uh, that were necessary to succeed at the academy, and it really paid off in a big way. I was very, I was much more comfortable, I think, in that first year than I would have been otherwise. And you, uh, you describe your appointment to West Point as being a rare appointment. So what does that mean? Actually, my staff did that. I, uh, <laughs> actually, they are rare. I, I, I look at it uh, in the context of uh, the number of applicants versus those who get in, and uh, I didn't qualify uh, when I attempted to get in as a uh, as a high school student. Uh, my uh, academic foundation improved dramatically. I had the athletic and uh, leadership or community background that I think folks were looking for, but officers at the academy had given me quite a bit of counsel uh, on what to do. So it was uh, definitely uh, time that paid off. I had fully intended to follow a normal uh, route as an enlisted soldier going into uh, uh, an infantry assignment uh, somewhere, almost left the academy at one point in my third year to go to a, a ranger battalion, but uh, an old master sergeant uh, convinced me that I could do more for the Army by staying in school and finishing uh, up my degree and getting commissioned. And as it turned out, uh, especially when I look around the walls or the legislation we've been able to be involved in, he was definitely right. And was there some mentor or someone that uh, paved your way to West Point, or did you do that pretty much on your own, too? Well, my mom was a big encourager uh, that I could, I could go beyond the limits. I'm convinced when I look back at her life that most of the walls were self-imposed. I do a lot of talking with young people, especially who come from, let's say, non-conventional backgrounds, that in this country the only limitation uh, to the opportunities that you have is what you believe is possible by yourself. It doesn't mean that you're, and I also tell folks they're going to fail. 
I failed at lots of things. I, I couldn't even get elected to student council when I was in high school. So sitting as a congressman right now uh, is uh, uh, quite ironic. I also didn't win my first election. And I think out of those experiences, the key is learning tenacity, which in, t in terms of a, of a character quality is as important as honor in being able to accomplish any task in the long run. The, there, there was a turning point, though, in my commitment to get into the academy. I worked as a janitor in high school. And uh, again, it was an issue of working very hard. I, I liked the fact that I could make money, but also see the fruit of my labor at the end of the day, and got promoted rather quickly. I had an opportunity to uh, do a vacation relief over a period of several weeks in the middle of, of uh, my last summer that I was uh, uh, working before graduating and was uh, cleaning the gift shop in the, the Western Pennsylvania Hospital. And there was an elderly woman working there, uh, a, a lady named Mrs. Ridgeway. And uh, I was oblivious to who she actually was. And at one point, she would make small talk with me as this week went on and I was relieving the, uh, the custodian. And she said, well, Jeffrey, what do you want to do when you finish high school? And I said, well, I'd really like to go to West Point, but I don't think I'll be able to. I'm just going to enlist in the Army uh, because I really want to be in the Army. And she gave me this quizzical look and then said, I think you should talk to my husband. And unbeknownst to me, uh, it, her husband, uh, when I realized it was Penny Ridgway, was the wife of Matthew Ridgway, who commanded the 82nd Airborne Division in the Normandy invasion, the 8th Army in Korea, and was chief of staff of the Army. And so after, uh, a week after a visit to West Point, where I was told that I definitely was non-competitive for admission, uh, but if I was willing to work hard, there might be a possibility to get in, I went early one Sunday morning uh, to his house uh, over in a very affluent section of Pittsburgh and, and met with the general for about an hour and a half. And uh, we talked. He wrote a very small letter saying that I should be considered for admission. I honestly don't know. I have that buried in a, in a box uh, somewhere in my house, but I don't know whether that really had any impact or not. I, I think that getting my SAT score from 900 to 1400 probably helped a, a little bit with that as well as <laughs> improving my academic performance. But what was very inspirational to me was talking to this man who was in his twilight of his, of his life with this uh, plethora of, of trophies, if you will, the command flags, and telling these very human, very real anecdotal stories uh, that this was a real person who had real struggles and dealt with real issues of life, not just the military issues, but just personal things. And it, it had a transformative effect on me and that I, I thought, wow, this is a hugely inspirational experience. He was one of the first people I came back to visit after I graduated to let him know uh, six years later that I did in fact make it. One little footnote to the history so far. <clears throat> Which was the high school where you served as janitor? Oh, no, it was the high school. It was Western Pennsylvania Hospital where I was a janitor. Oh, I see. I thought it was, uh, okay. It was, during, it was during high school. And, and your coming to uh, Kentucky is later in your life, right? I mean, yeah, my first exposure to Kentucky was in the Army. Okay. Uh, first as a cadet at West Point, uh, we had to come down for some training at Fort Knox. And my only exposure to the outside world was sneaking off post with uh, one of my classmates who's a uh, retired, very senior officer now just to see what Radcliffe, Kentucky looked like and go to a couple of stores before coming back uh, to the barracks. Uh, however, I went into the, I chose after doing an independent research project uh, my senior year at the military academy during my first class year, uh, I made the decision that I wanted to go into the cavalry scout track in Armor Branch, and I was at Fort Knox uh, for maintenance school and for uh, that Cavalry Scout program for about six months and absolutely fell in love with Kentucky and determined that if I could ever get back to that state, I was going to do it. And uh, uh, not long after I got out of the service, I was offered a job in the, and I res have resided in the 4th District ever since. What was there in particular about Kentucky that uh, so appealed to you? I, I, it just felt right. I liked the culture, I liked the people. So very genuine and open, uh, and, and certainly it didn't hurt that at the time with a, uh, a couple of car payments and new babies that it was also an opportunity to significantly increase my income. But we really wanted to put roots down. I moved a lot as a child. Certainly my wife and I moved a lot in the Army, but I never really had a lot of stability as a kid. And to live in one place uh, and to really be part of a community was a new concept for me. So I was certainly grateful for that. I had no expectation of ever getting into uh, politics or Congress. When I was in the Army, my classmates read me about this all the time. That I was the always 
uh, uh, despised politicians and had something negative to say about them. And I guess it's like it says in the Bible, don't uh, uh, judge or you become what you judge. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> it looks to me like uh, your studies at uh, West Point sort of had two tracks to them. One, a very academic uh, language position mm -hmm. and, and the Arabic and, and so forth. And the other, uh, more down-to-earth military service. Explain what was going on. I went through a, a bit of an academic epiphany while I was in, in school and uh, decided that really there was a place for learning philosophy, concepts of knowledge, uh, gaining the base of wisdom. But I also wanted to study strategic thought as when I determined uh, the role my head around the office of non-commission is when you've got everything to lose and nothing to gain by doing the right things. And seeing time after time how uh, history uh, was turned as William C. Oates, a Confederate commander who was defeated by Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain at the end of Little Round Top on the, at Gettysburg, in one of those times of decision uh, that showed the inward character of both men when he ruefully made the comment that uh, history is often decided by small and insignificant things. And so we, we look at uh, how uh, entire chains of events can be uh, turned by those individual decisions. And so I uh, had a chance to do some real research, publish some journal articles that were uh, largely an intellectual way for me to explore ways of thinking. At an early time, the beginning of the military reform movement, I, I chuckle now because I'm the chairman of the National Security Reform Caucus uh, here in the House with Susan Davis, who's, who's my co-chair from uh, California, a Democrat. And many of us are working uh, very aggressively on the issue of bringing about a second wave of reforms to further integrate our, our wider national security apparatus, but the seeds of it go all the way back uh, to those uh, colloquia, seminars, uh, papers that were being written, times sitting around eating pizza and drinking coffee late into the night, uh, discussing how we would run the Army if we ever got there. And as one of my classmates who's a general and I reminded, now we're there. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than we thought when we were uh, naive and knew everything. So what was the length of time that you were at West Point? Uh, four years. I went in in the summer of 1977 and uh, I graduated in 1981. So take the steps then from West Point to when you, when you left the service. Well, after a, uh, a, a much desired graduation leave, had a month to kind of run around and let my hair down, literally. Got myself a haircut at the end of that time, loaded everything up in my pickup truck and uh, went to Fort Knox to go through maintenance uh, in the scout uh, program. Uh, my Pat and I decided over Christmas that we wanted to get married and began working plans towards uh, that and then went off to uh, uh, Ranger School uh, pretty much from there. So talk about that. Uh, it, another transformative experience. I, ironically, uh, our mentor for the Ranger program at, at Fort Knox is going to the Armor Advanced Course at the time and, and later a Ranger instructor is Major General uh, Bernie Champeau who's uh, I was a former uh, deputy commander at ISAF in Afghanistan, but also a longtime ranger and is the uh, chief of the Office of Congressional Legislative Liaison now. And we've worked extensively together in trying to improve Army communications, really pairing relationships with officers uh, so they can know members and vice versa to, to really open up chains of communication uh, to get things done for the country, uh, ultimately. But what, what struck me is, so many relationships have come back full circle that I never in my wildest expectation would think would build that foundation but I think it goes back to a comment that MacArthur made when he was the superintendent of West Point in, in 1921 I believe he, he had given a speech about intramural sports and athletics and he said uh, uh, on these fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds and on other fields and other days will bear the fruits of victory and I'm really seeing that now when I spoke to the uh, the new class of general officers uh, I looked out and saw Bill Hicks, very good friend. He was one of General Petraeus' principal counterterrorism advisors, a very successful special operations officer. Uh, we also were in the 82nd Airborne Division together, and he was the commandant of the uh, Advanced Airborne School when, I, when he put me through the Jump Master program. You know, kind of one of these small world things. Uh, a friend of mine from my company, from uh, the next class, uh, class of 82, uh, uh, Field Artillery Brigade commander in Iraq, uh, commander in the Green Zone. Uh, we were in the same company at West Point for three years. He, he was a, a much better lacrosse player than I was, so he <laughs> went on to great things. I went back to intramurals, but, uh, uh, but, but it, relationships like that, I think, speak to 
this over and over and over again, where there's a trust and a confidence that, that's interwoven. I had uh, been planning on going to Germany uh, to be in the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, and my mom, my grandfather was very, very ill, was staying with my mother at the time, and there were some other um, problems that uh, were plaguing my mom, and I really needed to be closer to home in that interim period. And so I took a year uh, and was in the training command at Fort Dix, uh, and it actually what turned out to be one of the most challenging assignments I had in the military, really training soldiers, but also uh, turning organizations around. It lit a bug in my mind because we activated an organization and uh, also turned one into, uh, uh, from uh, being the dregs, uh, into a top performing company at the end of nine months. And I began, I in a sense, uh, seeing a place for organizational development, making teams more productive, more successful. And it went back to the original thread of why do people make the decisions that they do in certain circumstances to get certain outcomes. Uh, I went on to flight school from there. Uh, that's when I was married, was in flight school. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the honeymoon was in Enterprise, Alabama, and doing emergency procedures at night until we could uh, uh, come out, and then spent the rest of my time in the Army, uh, largely at Fort Bragg, uh, a little bit of time back at the Aviation Center. Uh, the 82nd Airborne was a wonderful experience. I served as a, uh, a flight commander, uh, led a flight section in a assault helicopter unit and then uh, uh, served as the uh, operations officer uh, for our uh, Peace Enforcement Aviation Mission with the Multinational Force and Observers. I got picked by, out of a group of officers and was offered that opportunity, which was probably the most challenging uh, operations assignment that I could get as a captain in the division, as an aviator at that time, plus the flying was great. And a, uh, Where were you based for that? Uh, we were actually out of... Um, uh, Rossness Roddy Airfield. It, it looks totally different now. Back in the, it's all resorts throughout that area now, which I guess is a sign to the benefits of peace versus continual conflict. But uh, it, it was uh, located down near Sharm el Sheikh at the southern tip of the Sinai. And, uh, or, well, actually, Ras Muhammad is the southern tip, but it's uh, right at the, near the Straits of Tehran. And we ran. Uh, aviation patrols and medevac resupply throughout the entire Sinai. Uh, principally, we were also uh, providing logistics and support to the U.S. Infantry Battalion. Then the northern logistics were handled by Australians and New Zealand's uh, New Zealand Air Force at the time, supporting Colombians, Fijians, and uh, uh, other international troops. And the mission there was to do what? what, we, what we uh, basically, do? it was just a basic, uh, very straightforward peacekeeping mission. Uh, to enforce the 1979 treaty between Israel and Egypt. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the principal threats, it was, uh, there, there was a lot of instability in Lebanon at the time. Uh, the, the challenges that were taking place there, Qaddafi was a genuine threat uh, uh, to American interests at that standpoint. There was a lot of activity around us. The, uh, the, certainly as we went over into Gaza and the frontier areas, uh, saw the looming challenges ahead with what became the Intifada shortly afterwards, uh, uh, this increased integration of uh, what I now would call Islamism, but seeing it on the front side, uh, the uh, young angry, angry children that threw rocks at us in Gaza are now doing other things, uh, those who had lived so long. And I, I guess seeing a tragedy unfold in slow motion has been a, uh, a I, I just saw a lot of things. It took probably a year, some of the things I saw off the grid that were very troubling. It, it didn't make it such a black and white caricature as it often gets portrayed on the uh, news a lot more complicated. Uh, I came back from that fully expecting to go into a Black Hawk Flight Command uh, that a uh, uh, former commander wanted me to come and fly for him. And I was very excited about that, but it, not unlike the clerk, not unlike the soldier in the infantry uh, company that has the rare gift of typing, I had the rare gift of writing, and my professional journal articles came back and bit me. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, battalion commander, the, the division aviation officer, uh, Bobby Siegel, who's still a friend of mine from the class of 66, uh, picked me to go up to the division to help roll out the new aviation brigade concept. And they bring the AH-64 into the 82nd Airborne Division. I was uh, not very professional about that. In fact, I was livid because I thought I just deployed over here and I've done this and I've got a right to go back to flying helicopters in the operational side. I don't want to go to division staff. And it frankly, was naive. It turned out to be the best assignment I ever had in the Army in terms of substance. And we went uh, in 
one ironic story that I, I think is very germane to share relative to this, because knowing all these personalities and where they've ended up, or where they were before I, I was at Fort Bragg and where they've ended up after is even uh, more interesting. But uh, I realized after a time, uh, particularly when my boss threw into my lap a, uh, a plan to activate this aviation brigade and the table of organization and equipment, I saw clearly just as a young aviator, didn't remotely fit the needs of, of a rapid deployment force unit at that time, especially the way we actually uh, trained and divided our assets to support the three infantry brigades and the division artillery. Uh, it was a rare opportunity where I got to pull some all-nighters and built that aviation brigade uh, literally uh, from the tent pegs uh, up to reapportioning the aircraft, uh, uh, the support assets and personnel within fixed constraints. And it was a, uh, uh, you're not going to see my name on any monument anywhere. Uh, some of the supporting documents I've, that were unclassified I've kept in boxes just as mementos. But we went and we briefed uh, then the G3 uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Crocker, who retired as Lieutenant General George Crocker, but also commanded the 82nd Airborne Division in the, uh, in the mid-90s. The funny moment was he was an infantryman's infantryman at West Point and never missed an opportunity to insult aviators while, while he was a tactical officer of the Regimental XO there. Well, I show up with him at, right after he came out of command of uh, uh, one of the 505 uh, Regiment Battalions. He's the G3. I'm just back from the Middle East. He actually knew me. I liked him as a cadet, got along very well with him uh, at the time. And another cadet named T.D. Decker, who was the Assistant Division Aviation Officer, came from 1st to 17th Cab. And uh, we were collaborating in parallel on some issues related to this, this huge change in the way the division deployed because our uh, structure was going to dramatically change. We we're going to downsize assets and actually increase our mission productivity and footprint which we would call that lean manufacturing on the outside. Again, everything I've done in my life comes back to this organizational productivity issue, uh, I, I realized later. We went in and briefed, uh, I, ironically, I had briefed the division commander before we went in to brief the G3, and sort of an odd reversal because of some different uh, uh, command relationships, but we went in to uh, uh, brief Colonel Crocker, and I walked him through the table of organization and did the standard uh, briefing and uh, uh, TD, who was a football quarterback at West Point, very successful entrepreneur now on the outside, was uh, filling in some additional details. And then he said, well, Captain Davis, that's just fine. What would this so-called aviation brigade, give me an example of a mission that it would do different than now. And one I had ironically kicked around in my mind, going back to a project I'd done in military science at West Point in 1979 and 80, uh, I threw out on the table because now I had performance data I was accomplished a little bit as a professional now and could support this and said, well, sir, an example of this would be to pick up an infantry battalion, move it 200 kilometers with all of its supporting assets, set up the forward area, rearmory fuel points, cross a major line of communications or obstacle like a river and seize a uh, key area or be a blocking a position of screening force, which ironically was precisely what the 82nd Airborne did in Desert Storm uh, a couple years later, <laughs> Un unbeknownst to any of us at the time. But, but here was the kicker, is uh, uh, Colonel Crocker said to me, well, and just who would command this Aviation Brigade Task Force? And I said, well, of course, sir, the Aviation Brigade Commander would do that, which uh, in no short order I was uh, re replied with a, he replied with a, get the hell out of my office right now. No goddamn aviator is going to command infantry soldiers. Well, famous last words, because when they did that mission, it was the Aviation Brigade Commander that took those troops up there and did that. And I think we've seen a change dramatically in the way the Army is institutionally adapting. And it's a uh, very exciting, no insult to uh, Crocker was an awesome commander and I, he was one of the few guys I could say I'd follow just about anywhere. But how we have our assumptions and our mindsets challenged. And so uh, from there, uh, I finished up my time in the 82nd, went back to the Aviation Center to have some stability. I uh, prayed about it for a long time, but really felt that uh, the Army was my life but I made a vow to God uh, as, a, uh, as a, a young husband that my kids would know the father I didn't know. And I knew that chasing my uh, adrenaline addiction by doing all these things around the world was gonna have to maintain some stability and balance. And so we went to the Aviation Center for a year, uh, worked briefly with a couple of companies in the aerospace industry, but really I, I would say my 
professional life began when I got to Kentucky. And then uh, after a couple of years in the software and integration business, I started my own consulting company and ran that for 12 years uh, before uh, getting into this, hmm. which was kind of an ac by accident, I would say. Tell us how that. Um, well, we had, uh, <laughs> I was up in Chicago doing some work. Uh, and uh, ironically, the night before, I had dinner with my friend uh, T.D. Decker, who was living up in the Chicago area, I was working with a client up there, and driving back to O'Hare, uh, this was in uh, early August of 2000, just had this feeling that some things were going to change direction at the end of the year. Purely thought it was of a business sense. And uh, it, it, as I was looking at some things we were doing professionally in the company at the time, what ended up happening was uh, in the 2000 election, I was so disconnected from what was happening politically because uh, uh, we had inadvertently lost our congressional seat to a gentleman named Ken Lucas, who had uh, won it after Jim Bunning moved up to the Senate. Uh, not anything personal against Mr. Lucas, but I didn't agree with a lot of the things that he was doing as the member, but never saw myself as taking on an incumbent, and then nobody would run against him. If the uh, sitting state senators, state representatives, county judges, and he virtually got a pass in the 2000 election with a fringe candidate who I ironically knew was a fringe candidate. Nice guy, but no business getting into this game uh, from the other end of the district. And it, it hit me uh, right around New Year's that if nobody's going to do it, I, I thought back to Harmony Church and this verse from Isaiah that was painted on one of the barracks walls down there in the Ranger Department that said, uh, and whom shall we send? Here I am, send me, Isaiah 6-5. And the, uh, was one of those mottos of always being a ranger would always accept the mission. And uh, I just began the process incrementally. Made a lot of mistakes, didn't understand the business. Uh, just, again, I, I believe I, I look back to those formative experiences when I was there on learning to be tenacious and to keep going no matter what, that, that, uh, uh, that you can stretch yourself farther than you imagine possible. And we ran what one of my special forces friends considered kind of a classic insurgent campaign, building one relationship at a time and, and uh, building allies, uh, networks of all the different groups of folks around this uh, common ground issues. Uh, came very close in that first race, was defeated, and uh, uh, learned the importance that, yes, you, you have to raise money. <laughs> it's important to be able to buy TV time to get your message out. But it matured me a lot as well. And I, and I think what I would call my... Uh, uh, baseless uh, idealism went away through that. My commitment to ideals and, and values was still there. But we came back and won uh, the seat in 2004. I had one of the toughest races in 2006, had a great campaign, decisively won that, and then the 08 election. And have really been, been able to invest, I think, in a way to be uh, effectively serving our constituents. It really, uh, for me, I walk over in the chamber sometime and I go back and I remember some of those experiences from when I was a little kid where I uh, could never visualize myself doing anything other than uh, just kind of existing. And walking through the house chamber, not that everybody's not a sinful fallen human being saved by grace walking around over there, but the idea that that opportunity would open up. And I look at, at some of the other uh, countries in the world where you're literally uh, born into a caste in the sense at birth, or you take an examination, if you don't perform well, you're kind of put into a box for the rest of your life. Uh, America is kind of the land to begin again. And for me, who was, uh, uh, lacked a lot of confidence in academics as a kid or uh, self-confidence in relationships, what I saw were opportunities to learn and, and opportunities to grow and to adapt. And for that, it's been a, a, a great blessing. And I, th I think I, I, I'll leave you with a story that doesn't relate to the military at all, but I, but I think something that's uh, very important. And now that I sit on the Ways and Means Committee and I remember being told in high school and college how that was the most prestigious committee in the House. And if you got on that committee, that was the place to be. And it is an exciting place in many ways. I, I've learned that it's never one person. It's always collective efforts or coalitions of, of people, both in the Congress and outside, that are working together for common cause. But, but I had always ha had this latent fear of having to live as an adult what I did as a child. The idea that of now what I realized were, were families that were or family environment that was non-functional, that didn't understand unconditional love, that didn't understand an innate sense of security. I can remember much of the time as a child being scared, at, at, both physically and just the idea of abandonment was always out there in my mind in many ways. 
And we had led a retreat program in 1997 at the Military Academy, which was the largest in the history of the Academy. Ironically, it was a class of 2001. And much of our discussion, though we talked about biblical principles and, and relationships to Christ and about how to be a soldier and represent these values because of the tough nature of the business in, in a very complicated world. Uh, those of us that had been asked to lead it, who all knew each other from our cadet days many years before, had this gnawing sense that this class was going to graduate into a war. Uh, and I, I wrote this in my journals at the time. John Cook, who was the chaplain at the military academy, same feeling. He had, we'd been in the 82nd at the same time before he went to seminary. And um, very, very strong convictions. But it was a, a catharsis in many ways just to go back and to be back and begin to understand that generation upon generation, that long gray line, were the lives of dedicated Americans that were being invested in other Americans to perpetuate the values given to us in the Constitution. And though it doesn't seem that way when you're covered with mud and hungry and you're and, and filled with grief about something that's happened, you keep going. And it's the, the fruit over a long time. But still in the back of my mind was this family issue. And I walked out that Christmas, it was in a snowstorm, and then I realized the, the, the blessings we have in this country. And uh, at the house I lived in at the time, the snow would blow up on the back deck and it would melt, leak under the door, make the carpet wet. So I would go out and dutifully sweep that off. I, I walked out and it was uh, a couple days before Christmas in this uh, just howling snowstorm going on outside in the dark. So I sweep that away and I look in and I drop the broom and I was just there, I was transfixed. Looking uh, through the, uh, uh, the French doors into where our kitchen and, and, and family room, great room was in our little house there. And in the living room was the Christmas tree lit up with presents under it, fire burning in the fireplace. Baby Miriam's asleep in a bouncy seat. Hannah and Sarah were playing Barbie dolls on the floor. I mean, a very idyllic scene. Uh, Christmas music was leaking out through the cracks in the door and also the smell of cookies. And I looked in and my, uh, the little girl who's up there in the picture down near the Florida Ranger camp, the baby is a, a school teacher in Indiana today, but she had this oversized apron on with my wife and they were baking in the kitchen and you could smell that. And I just, uh, I began weeping. Uh, uncontrollably because and it was just this revelation for me that that curse was broken it was gone forever and and I, I I was literally in the metaphor was so powerful to me because there I was in the dark on the outside looking in I was in the cold dark you know in the snow swirling around looking in at this scene and I could not and I realized and it was one of those bittersweet moments that I could never understand the sense of unconditional security or love that those children felt that transparent acceptance, but I knew that they would not have to ever endure in that what I had. And I think it was a, you know, both the uh, blessing of the Lord, but also being in a place where we could step out of that. And, I, and it shaped, that, that for me was probably one of the most significant moments of my entire life in terms of, of, of I, I won't call it an achievement because it wasn't that, but if there was a gift I was going to take hold of, it, it would be that probably more than any other. And, and walking this road, and I think the, you know, it, maybe it's the ranger lesson you come back to in this, is just in life, you just have to keep walking. And even if you stumble, is to get up and keep walking and, and accept that grace that's there to keep going. I, there's no reason in any earthly measure of merit that any of this should be here at all. I'd like to say it's because of me, but it's not. It's just uh, taking advantage of the opportunity. But I love this country. We're not perfect, certainly got our flaws, but I, uh, I've been you know, very grateful to, to be able to see and be part of some of the things that I have and just be touched by some really wonderful folks. What a moving story it really is. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll stop now? Yeah, I, that's, it's,